hello and thank you all for joining hopefully your second or third session of the day. Um, my name is Gina Turnage, if you don't know me, and I am part of the Hypothesis team. Um, I'm so excited to see so many people attending. And again, we really do appreciate the time you're taking to spend with us. I have the pleasure of introducing our presenter from Kingsborough Community College. So please welcome Jason Leggett, who will be leading our session titled Equitizing the Syllabus, Measuring Effect with Social Annotation and AI Coding. And as you can see, Jason has posted his slide deck in the chat. Um, and if you have questions, please feel free to so the interactive session, post in the chat, ask questions in Q&A. We're happy to hear what you're thinking and uh, get your feedback. So Jason, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much, Gina. Um, let me just share my screen. We're good? Okay, great. Um, so for this presentation, I'm giving you a bit of a snapshot of a larger project uh, that I'm involved in. Um, as part of our equity initiatives at Kingsborough Community College, uh, we've had some professional development seminars, and then we had a race and equity leadership academy. And one of the things that they asked us to do was to review this tool from Center for Urban Education uh, and look at our syllabi and make changes to our syllabi to have more of an equity focus. Um, and so as I was going through this process, uh, I also wanted to link it up with uh, a project that we're doing with Ashley Finley from American Association of Colleges and Universities, uh, where we're looking at new methodologies to try to measure uh, what students are, kind of what their affect is, how they're feeling about courses, and how that relates to outcomes, uh, including graduation retention, um, disaggregated by race, gender, and uh, economic um, mm -hmm. class, basically. Um, so one thing I you know, really focused on when I did the review was this question of who does my syllabus serve? So I kind of wanted to use that as my um, kind of forming question as I went uh, into the process of revising my syllabus. Um, and so as we were revising syllabi, the question came up among the faculty about, well, how will we know whether students um, you know, are reading the syllabus? How Do they care about the changes we've made? Um, how will we know this has made any difference? Um, and I'd already started using Hypothesis for some readings, and I thought, well, this is a great idea, um, is just to throw it into Hypothesis and then just let the students um, kind of tear it up. Uh, but a colleague of mine had given me some instructions for what she uses in her class with Hypothesis. Um, and so I, I decided to use uh, her instructions for this assignment um, and just kind of see how that played. Uh, and as you can kind of see here, they'll put a little code um, and then they'll make their comment and that's responding to something in the syllabus. Um, I also wanted to see this as a way to collect data so I could start to collect data on this in addition to um, Google Forms and other ways that I was collecting data from students um, as part of an IRB uh, project that I'm looking at. Um, and I also just wanted to just kind of see would this make this more interactive um, than I used a syllabus quiz in the past. Um, but that's still kind of disjointed, right? They look at the syllabus, and then they're going online to a Google form and then filling it out. And I'm not quite getting the same um, kind of thing. So I was really curious to see how students would react to these changes um, and probably a little bit nervous as well. Um, not totally sure that they would they would like the changes. Um, so just briefly, a little bit is just thinking about hypothesis as a form of data collection um, is largely to try in this in this instance, I was looking at affect. So I was really trying to see, did things make them angry? Um, they invented a code called love. So are they happy about those changes? But I also wanted to have them get into the habit of asking questions. Uh, and so I wanted to make sure that they were able to um, kind of think about it that way as they were going through the syllabus. So these instructions were given to them ahead of time. Um, the, the question that, uh, was asked to me um, in preparation for this webinar was, you know, why use the annotations for this purpose? And I think now that I've done it and reflecting on what I've found is that the responses are actually much more authentic than they are on the Google form. So students are much more, um, they're using kind of everyday speech and they're focusing on things that are interesting to them. Whereas the Google forms assignment that I was doing with the syllabus was kind of directing them places. And so they were kind of maybe giving me answers that they thought I wanted as opposed to things that 
um, they really cared about. The other issue is that this feels a lot more like the in-person interactions that I have in the classroom. And so because this was an asynchronous class um, and it's capped at 25 students, um, it sometimes feels like there's this kind of great distance between us. And this has allowed us to just kind of get a little bit closer together and replicate that kind of feeling. So the other ways I want just to think about it is you can download uh, the the annotations, you know, in, using a, um, a CSV file or a, for Excel, um, and you'll see that over kind of in the lower right hand corner. Um, and those are just kind of different ways that I'm pulling data from annotations that I'm then uploading into Atlas TI uh, and then having those generate codes uh, and themes. And there's a lot of different stuff. I'll show you a little bit of it in, in the next slide. Uh, but that kind of just takes these uh, answers, these annotations, and then organizes them in a way that I can kind of see trends and patterns across uh, the different assignments. You can also put them in a PDF, which I'm finding a lot more useful because you can clean them up. So you kind of see this example here where it looks more like a script. Um, and then it kind of just makes it a little bit easier uh, to manage the data. So just wanted to kind of give you a couple ideas on just um, how you might download the data, how you might clean it up and organize it. Uh, before you upload it into an Atlas TI, or you could always do the old fashioned way of, of coding it by hand. Here are the instructions I gave to students. Uh, and so you'll see here that I provide uh, a couple options for them. So some hyperlinks that shows them how they can do the annotations, uh, kind of a step by step process, uh, as well as uh, giving them these specific codes that they're uh, going to use um, that focus on asking questions things they find interesting, anything that's confusing, anything they were surprised by, anything that makes them angry, uh, and anything that they might offer additional research. That one isn't used as much, um, but the love was the new one that they uh, invented and they, they, they were pretty proud of that. Um, and here's also a video for them just kind of going over the feature itself and kind of what it can do. So they kind of get a lot of uh, front-loaded information before they go into the actual syllabus. So the initial findings just from this one class uh, were pretty interesting to me. So on the left hand side, I was kind of curious, you know, when you make changes to a syllabus, you're hoping that more students will have annotations in those areas. Um, I should probably not, I, I wasn't surprised that the majority of the annotations were actually in the course schedule. So students wanted to know what's happening in the course. Um, but I was surprised that policies were as high as they were. I, I didn't think that students were necessarily paying attention to policies before I was using the annotation software. I just kind of thought that was standard stuff that they um, didn't really have much to say about, but I, it turned out I was wrong, right? They actually have quite a few opinions about the policies, uh, whether those are my classroom policies, whether those are the Kingsborough College policies, um, they were quite active in those areas. And I was pleasantly uh, surprised to see the equity statement that I had added to this uh, syllabus uh, got nine, right, annotations, which you know, it means that students were looking at it and were thinking about it. Um, and then the expectations and negotiation, again, they had things to say uh, in that category. Um, probably interesting to me um, that we put a lot of emphasis in the syllabus revision on the welcome message and um, no students put any annotations there. Uh, and I'm not quite sure how to interpret that. I'll wait a few more semesters and, and see if students do tend to annotate there. Um, out of the total 116 annotations, um, as you'll see, 21 of the 24 students actually completed them, and love was the most common code uh, by quite a bit, actually. Uh, and like I had hoped, students were asking questions, <clears throat> and the angry one uh, was mostly uh, involved with the equity statement when it was saying things about injustice, and students were angry that injustice was still kind of going on uh, in the discipline that I teach, which is constitutional law. Um, and so they're just kind of reacting to that uh, that way. I also want to look at uh, the most used adjectives just to see if there was kind of um, a match right from the codes uh, to the language that they're using in their annotations. So again, this is something that Atlas TI can do. Um, and so I, it was interesting, right? You see surprising, expensive. They're talking about the fact that they appreciate this was an open educational resource class, so they didn't have to buy an expensive textbook. Um, they found often they use the word helpful or something in that kind of nature. Uh, to talk about how the explanations, especially in the policy section, uh, were laid out. Uh, they were also focused on, they liked the organizing of the uh, materials, and so um, they kind of commented on that and how that made them feel great, uh, how they think they would be more productive in the course based on how the course was outlined. 
my next steps are uh, to really dive down. I watched a, a session at the plenary yesterday um, and this kind of concept of being a guide on the side through readings. And so I have been starting to try to do that. Um, I'm doing a presentation uh, in June on teaching Foucault in the community college. Uh, and so I've been using some readings and having see what kind of uh, questions and reactions students have to those readings. Um, and it's been really fascinating. Uh, there's been a lot of, you know, uh, kind of inquiry based uh, approaches to the readings where they see something that they find interesting and then it take they'll go out and do some research on that and then come back uh, and drop uh, research links or website articles um, into into the into the annotations, which is really interesting. I didn't really anticipate them doing that. Um, and so that's going to preoccupy my time for at least the next couple of months of thinking deeply about how I can encourage that more and how I can maybe steer them towards um, you know, reliable sources, peer reviewed sources. Uh, and I did also hear yesterday that we can link through JSTOR. So I'm really interested in doing that as well. Um, the other thing was that through this, by looking at the annotations this way, I've found that there are certain topics that students are interested in um, and that things that they appreciate about the course content. And so I'm going to go back and revise my course outline to really focus on those things that students are interested in uh, and probably take out some things that weren't as popular, that there were fewer annotations on. Um, for example, I had one reading um, where it was pretty obvious the students didn't like it. There's only about three annotations. Um, and so I think uh, I'll just get rid of that reading. The other thing I've been working on is trying to be more responsive. So I'll take the annotations, download them, upload them into Atlas, get the codes, and get a sense of kind of how the class as in the aggregate is reacting to the reading. And then I can make uh, I've got a YouTube video here that kind of puts the information back to them. So here's what you said. Here's what's common among your answers. Uh, and then here's maybe like where you might be missing the mark, or this is what you definitely, you know, understood correctly. So it kind of helps me be able to design responsive assignments uh, that help them uh, navigate through the course a little bit clearer uh, and able to kind of also reflect on what they're learning. And it kind of gets to, to that metacognitive aspect of, of the kind of thing I think that annotation is trying to get us to is to this kind of back and forth, uh, but also that they can kind of think deeply about what they've already said uh, in previous readings. They can go back and collect those annotations. Um, and so I think that I have kind of three paths here that you see. I'm trying to focus in more on what content students care about, uh, focus a little bit more on uh, the reading comprehension of more difficult readings, uh, and then the third thing being responsive uh, assignments that then kind of tail are tailored to what the students are doing in the course. Um, and so it kind of started with this inquiry of, you know, how do I how do I think students are going to react to a, a equity syllabus using annotations that way? And it's kind of exploded from there um, to be much more immersive uh, using these tools. So I want to make sure that there's time for any questions. Um, and if there's anything people are looking for specifically, uh, in their own work, um, or if you have any questions on what is an equity syllabus or anything like that. So I'll stop at this point uh, and open it up. We don't have any questions as of yet. I think you're doing a very thorough job, and I think that it's very thought-provoking. I love starting with the syllabus, obviously, and then focusing on the equity of it, and then getting feedback from students so that you can then sort of tweak and update how you relate to them, what you expect from them. Um, okay, we have a question about what is Atlas? And then uh, why don't you answer that one? And we've got two more questions. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, and thank you for what you just said. I, mean, I think going through this process has been interesting. Um, I kind of, at first, was just thinking about hypothesis as a way to see what students were reading. And trying to understand, you know, how much of the reading they were doing, uh, and now it's kind of really changed the way I think about it uh, entirely. Um, Atlas TI, and thanks for the the link in the chat there, um, is basically it's just a it's a coding software designed by ethnographers, um, and so I try to explain it in the simplest ways. It's just um, you know in the in the old days uh, you'd get your data. Uh, kind of in the form of like an interview. Um, and then you'd kind of go through and you'd hand code, right? So you'd say this one is about um, 
you know, I'm trying, I'm blanking here, but I'm just going to use the examples that were in the class. Like this one's about law uh, or this one's about politics or this one's about, you know, um, criticism, right? These are the three codes. So instead of me having to do that now, um, Atlas TI has an AI program that it will auto code uh, and it'll go through and I'd say, you know, it's pretty accurate. I mean, sometimes they get some pretty goofy codes, but uh, most of the time they're codes that I would have come up myself. Um, and then from those codes, you can generate, like you see here, these word clouds. Um, and so basically it just lets me go through the student responses much more quickly than I would if I was just reading them individually. Um, and so it gives me a good sense of how the class is doing uh, as in the aggregate, but then it also allows me to kind of narrow in and say, okay, if this is where the class is, and um, one student is, let's say, uh, still struggling with this concept, um, I can kind of see where's the difference. Like, why why are these students getting it, and then this student is struggling? So I think that's how Atlas TI just kind of helps get a much quicker turnaround time uh, as far as trying to create responsive assignments to where students are. I agree, Omar. This is very enlightening um, and sounds easy to use. And I have to say, I haven't seen a word cloud in a long time, so it's great to see it again. Um, so we have some questions. Uh, Kevin wants to know, when do students annotate the syllabus? Is it at the beginning of the term? And I might add, do you ever have them come back to the syllabus? I know some of our faculty do that. So uh, I'll let you answer that one. Yeah, there, so the short answer is they do it in the first week. Um, but some students, I mean, it's been real, what's been really interesting about that is um, I, I accept work at any time in the semester. Uh, and so for students who start to fall behind, I know whether they've seen the syllabus. So if you look at this part here where it says all students, right, I can click through and see what students have looked at the syllabus. And a lot of the, not a lot, but like four or five of the students, you know, had never looked at the syllabus. And so they get confused in week four or week five. Uh, and I'm able then to send them back to the syllabus and then they go through and annotate it. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see those kind of patterns developing where you've got the, the high achieving, highly motivated students uh, who kind of get in early and do their annotations and then use that to lay out their semester coursework. Uh, but then you've got the students who are struggling uh, and then you kind of are able to then point them back to the syllabus as being this organizing document because um, maybe they don't know that this is what it's supposed to do or, or maybe the syllabi in their other classes um, aren't very well organized. I've heard a lot of that from students. Um, and so it's just kind of interesting to have them uh, have that that difference there. I do come back to the syllabus throughout the semester, uh, and we do sometimes make reference to the annotations that they've made. So uh, I do this specifically kind of what you see in the upper left hand corner based on the topics that they're interested in. So uh, during this semester, a lot of students were interested in gun violence. Uh, as a topic for research. Uh, and so they posted comments and questions in the course outline section um, that would kind of help later when we kind of got to that section. I said, okay, remember when you asked this question in the syllabus, what do you think now? What, how have you changed your mind? Do you have any other further insights? Um, and so that was going kind of useful as well uh, as almost like a living document um, for students to kind of refer to. Um, I, I think I answered that, I think. Yeah, no, that was excellent. That's uh, that really is it in a nutshell. You're not formally saying, okay, we're creating a new assignment here. You're actually just referring to sort of this living document throughout because you can do it now because it's not a piece of paper that they put in their folder and it's an actual, um, you know, collaborative document that you all have access to. Kevin has a follow up on. Um, did students use your annotation marks in your annotation instructions as tags for the annotations? Good question, Kevin, because we do have the tagging functionality. Yeah, they haven't done that. Um, I do want to, to use that. It would make it a lot easier to organize at the end of it, especially. But yeah, they haven't done that yet. You'll also see that some of the students don't use the codes. Um, before they put their answer. So I think the tag would kind of help that. So I just have to make uh, instructions that now include that feature in it. Um, but I think that's a great idea. I think that'd be a good way to make sure that they're actually using the codes as well. And we do have um, information on that if anyone wants to know what that is. We've got some workshops and some content if uh, you're curious how to use multimedia and tags. Uh, Miriam is asking about the features of the LMS version and free 
Typically they are similar, Maryam. Um, the difference is the tighter integration, the grading, the ease of the students just clicking on the assignment in the free web extension version. You have to, everyone has to create an account, you create a private group, they join the group, and then you work outside of the LMS. Um, whereas the LMS app is working within the workflow of whichever LMS you're currently using. So much tighter integration, privacy, and then the grading functionality. Do you have anything to add to that, Jason, or did I cover that? No, that's that's really helpful. Um, yeah, this one's in Blackboard. We're switching over to Brightspace uh, next semester. So um, yeah, I think the functionality within the LMS is is excellent. Have I got everybody's questions answered? I don't want to make sure I didn't miss anybody before we. I go let Jason take take control. We've still got about seven minutes, so we can take more questions. Um, Jason, do you have anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, I'll I'll do maybe um, just two other points. One is um, as you see here, I I included this slide here because you have. Um, students starting to talk to each other without being instructed to do that. Um, and I find that, so the more often I use annotations, so for the, I've been using most of the readings are now using hypothesis. By about the fourth or fifth reading, they start talking to one another, um, again, without instructing them to do that. Because um, I think we've all had that experience in the discussion board where when you say comment on another student's post, they usually, hey, I agree um something like that right so what it's not the kind of interchange that we're like looking for over time um whereas there's something organic happening in hypothesis where they start off small they start with kind of just these little kind of comments to each other but then they start kind of engaging in longer dialogue the more readings they are so they they have so i kind of want to focus on that too and see if there's some way i might be able to either get instructions um I'd say I don't I don't want to overly instruct, but I want also them just to be aware that it's okay for them to to comment and talk back and forth with each other. Um, and I'm just kind of curious to kind of keep following that train of thought of like why is it like after the third or fourth reading that they kind of just naturally start doing this? Um, because there's something interesting there to me about kind of just the principles of annotation are kind of trying to get us to be socially thinking about a reading together uh, in the same way that we would do in like a reading group. Uh, and it does seem to be promoting that uh, naturally. I think it gives everyone, it gives everybody space, right? It, it's very inclusive. Um, everyone can share their, has a voice. They feel they belong. So as soon as they sort of get back that, get past that first barrier, then they feel free, it seems, or that's what we hear for to, to talk amongst themselves and build that community and continue to collaborate with each other because some of those barriers have been crossed or some of those barriers don't exist. Um, so Ellen has a question about <laughs> size. I think that's right. That's yeah, true. <laughs> right, yeah. Yeah. So uh, Ellen Eileen, sorry, Eileen, you know I know your name, um, wants to know if there's a brief way to show the process of exporting data to Atlas AI or if there's something we could post in the chat or if it's something that's quick to show. I, I can't. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure. I think. Okay. The simplest, we, yeah. Maybe we could send. We could address that later. I can touch base with Eileen and maybe connect the two of you. Yeah, and I that would be great because I, 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 I guess now you're making me think I should be looking for other people who are doing this, right? So, there, I can't be the only one. Well, you've you've obviously sparked a, an aha light bulb moment here. <laughs> that we need to be making those connections. Yeah. Yeah. So this but, is but, why this is why we talk to each other and why we talk to each other and build community and collaboration with each other. Yes. And okay, so we have more people that want to know how it's done. Okay, well, we'll work with uh Jason offline and see how we can get that information to everybody. So thanks for the interest in that. I told him the same thing before our call was I was interested to, to know the same thing. So we're all on the same page. Perfect. Because I think there's two ways you'd, I, you'd, I think you'd want to think about it. One is I, I at the plenary, I believe that uh, he had said that they're incorporating or you're incorporating AI features into hypothesis. 
So in the future, we're not in, not yet, not yet. What we've been doing is talking about how you can use social annotation to work with large language model and ideas on not for or against, but how you could actually use social annotation. Is that what you're saying? Is that what you're restating? Well, yeah, I'm just thinking that in the future down the road, you might not have to export data into another program. You might oh, gotcha. be able to okay. code it within, within the program. Got it. Okay. I agree. I see what you're saying. Thank kind you. Kind of similar to like, you know, an Adobe reader search, right? Like I think I think I could see that being a pretty a feature that could be easily integrated, I think. So that's one way of thinking about it is like you might not need to go out of the LMS. But I think Thank the second you. way is you'd have to I think you'd want to spend some time though, like even when I work with student research assistants, we we start hand coding first. And so I think, you know, you want to spend some time just when after you download your data, probably just an Excel spreadsheet, just getting comfortable to the coding before you upload it into Atlas, just kind of so you know what you want Atlas to do. Um, so I think that would be kind of unique to you. Like I said, I started doing spreadsheets, but those got kind of clunky to use in Atlas. So I kind of started copying, pasting into a Word document and then turning that into a PDF which has just been a lot easier to organize. Um, but that's a personal preference. I, I've seen other people use, you know, like exceedingly large spreadsheets um, and they just have better luck than, than I do, or, or they're just, I don't know, better at it in some way. So I think you just want to think about those two things. One being you might not have to go outside of the LMS in the future. And then especially if kind of what was mentioned before, if you're using tags, then tags are basically going to function the same way as codes. Um, and so I think there would just be other ways you could think about um, just using the, the the program as it is. And and if you're not ready to use something like Atlas, obviously Jason has given great ideas about creating equity on the syllabus, also using uh, documents like the syllabus as organic documents to learn more about your students and to provide what they're looking for or clarify anything or go back to to remind. I mean, I think something as simple as the syllabus, you guys spend a lot of time creating those things, knowing the students are actually engaging with them and in and, and being able to update, update them because you have actual, you know, feedback from them is is a great way to kickstart the semester and set some expectations and really just keep communicating with them outside of you know your sort of academic scholarly content. Um, well, we're just about at the end of time. This has been super enlightening, Jason. So thank you so much for sharing all your data, your time, your, your studying. Does anyone have any last minute comments or statements before we let Jason go or let everybody go? Oh, we're at time, so it's time to go. Thank you guys so Thank much. Hopefully so we'll much. see you at the next session. Bye.